I come to you in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today is the day we celebrate All Saints Day, the day we honor and remember the multitude of saints whose holiness inspires and encourages us in our faith. We recognize it today that it is because of the saints who have gone before us that we are. Those who have struggled and overcome personal challenges, those who have struggled for justice, who have given so that others may live more freely. We would not be if not for them. We remember with gratitude those whose hunger for righteousness and whose sacrifice have contributed to a more just society. We remember those who have loved us, nurtured us, embraced us, celebrated or supported us. We are because they were. We remember those who shaped our faith, who gave us art, gave us song, gave us poetry, gave us hope. Take just a moment to quietly remember those who shaped your lives and being. Today we remember to lean on the example of those who have gone on before us, drawing on the love, justice, community, and faith that weaves us together generation after generation, past, present, and future. It is important to stop our busy lives if just for a day, for a sermon, or just for a moment to remember that we arrived here thanks to those who went before us. As, as you remember the names of saints, known or unknown to the church, you had to have some idea of what a saint might be or do. We are all shaped by our faith tradition, our family, our community, our experiences, and our society. Let's explore together how we consider what is saintly. Today's gospel is a good place to start. Jesus is giving his disciples and the multitudes that are listening to him his foundational speech about who God is and the kingdom he wants to create. This is his first speech in Matthew and takes place at the perfect time after all the groundwork has been laid. The genealogy, the visit from the wise men, the escape to Egypt, the returning from Egypt, the baptism from John, his temptation, his initial ministry in Galilee, calling the disciples, and now? Now he is calling folks to hear about this kingdom and what the nature of citizenship in it will be. Everything that has happened led to this point. Jesus is on a mountain, kind of like Moses was, so we know it's important. And we should listen. When Siobhan just read the passage, you had very likely heard it before. Perhaps it's on a cross stitch in your house or on a special um, dish towel. Um, <laughs> the Beatitudes make it there. I ask you, however, to listen and think about it today as if, as if you were sitting on the mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee and are hearing it for the first time. Jesus is telling you about the ideal citizenship for God's kingdom. It will include the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, and you, when people revile you 
and persecute you because you utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on Jesus' account. Yes, this is a far cry from the Messiah the Jews were expecting, and Jesus seemed like he might be the one that delivered. But this description is not the powerful fire of Moses or the conquering power of David and Elijah. This is different. Jesus spent the rest of his ministry helping us see what God is truly like, and it was merciful, pure in heart, and sometimes even persecuted. Jesus kept surprising people because it was not what they were expecting or saw represented as power or even valued in their culture. Even today, when you consider our culture, is this the character we observe in our citizenship? Are these the characteristics we value? This is a good time to review and renew our perspective of God as Jesus teaches us. I bet some of the saints you remembered had these very characteristics, and we always yearn to find and have people in our lives like this, probably because it is connecting to God that is within us. God is calling us to discover these characteristics in ourselves. So let's look at them and perhaps the saints that we remembered. The first characteristic is poor in spirit. Now, many describe this as our lack of faithfulness or a lack of faithfulness or belief in God. We all, all of us, have times when we stumble and struggle or don't live up to what God wants us to be or do. I know that I do. Our character comes into play when we keep going back, when we keep looking for God. We may be poor in spirit today, but we keep reaching out to God. This is true faithfulness. We keep turning back to God and God's love. Over the last couple of weeks, we've had the chance to observe the saints who mourn. Specifically, I think of the parents of the children at Sandy Hook Elementary School on the anniversary of the event, who are still devastated by the loss of their children and continue to turn their grief into action against gun violence and access. When I was imagining those who mourn, I immediately thought of Judy and Dennis Shepard, Matthew Shepard's parents. I had the privilege of spending an evening with them and experienced the grace of mourning and love channeled into fighting for the rights of LGBTQ people across the country. When thinking of Meek, Jimmy Carter jumps right into my heart. He is such a faithful man and appears to submit without resistance to the will and desire of God quietly and faithfully living his faith every day. I'm sure there are many in his administration who might say differently, but he lives the life of faith inspired by God's love. As part of a project for a class that I'm taking, I listened to the October 15th sermon of Sari Atik at St. John's Norwood in Bethesda. Father Atik is a Palestinian-American and was preaching after the first week of the current warfare in Gaza. His sermon focused on not taking sides in the situation, but praying equally for both the Israelis and the Palestinians. He did it with such a hunger and thirst for righteousness. God's kingdom is better for having his perspective in it. With Matthew Perry's and other struggles with addiction in the forefront of the news, I think so many families as amazing examples of mercifulness. Many have learned that struggles, forgiveness, and love can all 
exist in the same place. As I mentioned last time I preached, my grandmother was blind. She went blind when my father was in college, so much of her life she lived as sighted. She adapted and did not complain to anyone, family, friend, or anyone, and she graciously adapted to her current circumstances. She was ever faithful to God and became an inspiration to many. She comes to mind as saintly and pure of heart. So many of the efforts at peacemaking are short-lived. The work of Bishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela as part of the Truth Commission in South Africa has stood the test of time. While not perfect, like many parts of God's kingdom, it is a work in progress. Forgiveness, a thirst for peace, and a willingness to sacrifice move the effort forward. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King Jr. took to task the clergy, many Episcopalians, for not supporting integration in the city, saying, who said that the time was just not right. King noted that it was the oppressed's struggle and they should set the time for action. He expressed disappointment in his colleagues. King was persecuted, jailed, and reviled there, and ultimately killed in Memphis for his efforts for the oppressed and righteousness in God's eyes. Yes, Jesus did have a powerful picture of God and God's kingdom that he painted for us on that hill in Galilee. On this All Saints Sunday, we see the character of God's kingdom as it was, as it is, and even how it can be. We can gain a perspective on what saintly is in those who shaped our lives, our faith, and our being. May we always be turning toward God, just as God is always turning to us to bring the kingdom here on earth. Amen.